Tonight, breaking news, the deadly shooting at a high school in St. Louis. A gunman dressed in all black opening fire just after 9 a.m. Terrified students escaping through windows, some jumping off the roof into the arms of police. Multiple people killed, others rushed to the hospital. What we're learning tonight about that shooter and his ties to the school. Also tonight, the triple threat outbreak, the flu, RSV, and COVID, creating a dangerous situation heading into the winter. Half of the students at one high school out sick as pediatric ICU beds fill up across the country. What you need to know to protect yourself and your family. Sparking hate, the troubling anti-Semitic demonstrations in L.A. after Kanye West made a slew of hateful comments. Several companies now cutting ties, but will Adidas, which has a billion-dollar deal with the rapper, follow suit? Violence on the tracks, the shocking incidents in New York City. A subway rider pushed off the platform. Others beaten as they ride the train. What the mayor is now doing to fight a 40% rise in crime on public transit. Plus the incredible rescue in Florida. A car sinking after crashing into a canal. The police officers and the delivery driver who jumped in to help. And fighting for Ty, the story of one incredible family we've been following for more than a decade. Ty Campbell bravely battling cancer for years, how his parents are channeling their pain and carrying on his legacy and the lives they've changed in the process. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, St. Louis, the latest community rocked by a senseless act of gun violence. A teenage shooter going on a deadly rampage in the halls of a school he once attended, just moments after classes began for the day. Students seem jumping from the roof of the Central Visual and Performing Arts High School and into the arms of police. Others say they jumped out of windows to escape the gunshots. The anguish clear on the faces of those who made it out. Students seen embracing one another and their families in a parking lot nearby. Multiple people, including the shooter, now confirmed dead. Among the victims, a 16-year-old female student and a beloved health teacher. Police late today naming the deceased gunman as 19-year-old Orlando Harris, a former student at the school. Authorities say he had no prior criminal history and that the motive remains unclear. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer, following all the late details, leads us off tonight. I have never seen anything like this. A local news helicopter captured the fear and chaos in St. Louis as high school students leapt from a rooftop to escape a young shooter with a long gun. I was trying to run and I couldn't run. <laughs> Me and him made eye contact and I'm glad I made it out because his gun got jammed. It happened at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School on the third floor. Parents racing to school. She's like, Mom, hurry up. They're shooting. She doesn't know how many, she didn't know how many people it was. So I just left work and I just ran here to get her. After the shooter quickly killed two, authorities say police ran towards the gunfire and struck the suspect, Orlando Harris, who attended the school last year and died as officers returned fire. The officers arrived quickly, uh, made entry with no hesitation, went directly to the sound of gunfire, which is the expectation not only of the department but of the community as well. Seven injured were taken to hospitals suffering from gunshot and shrapnel wounds. Among the dead, a beloved teacher, Jean Kuska, and a teenage girl. Survivors recounting the gunman's chilling words. When the uh, intruder broke into her room, then uh, the intruder said, get ready to die. Police not yet releasing a motive for the mass shooting, which happened just after 9 a.m. and was broadcast over the school's PA system. We all thought it's a drill at first. Like, okay, it's just a surprise drill. Okay, we're all good. No, it's a real thing. She said over there, yes, this is real. There's an intruder. Please, please be careful. And all hell just kind of breaks loose. Today's quick response from police comes in stark contrast to the massacre in Uvalde, where officers were blamed for systemic failures, including their slow response to engage the shooter. Parents in St. Louis grateful. I'm glad that they went in because I was going to go in too with them. Miguel Almaguer covering yet another school shooting in America. Miguel, I know you have some new reporting tonight, a presser just wrapping up. We're talking just hours after this horrible incident, but have police released any more details about the shooter? What do we know about a motive? I think the thing that sticks out for a lot of people is that he was 20 years old and he had entered the school. 
Yeah, Tom, a young man. We're still learning new details about the suspected gunman. Police say Orlando Harris may have been suffering from mental health problems. As you mentioned, he just graduated from that school last year. A big question tonight remains motives. Survivors say the shooter was dressed all in black, and the police chief also points out tonight that the school doors were locked, which likely slowed down that gunman. Tom. Miguel Almaguer with a lot of new reporting tonight, including the age of that shooter, 19, not 20 years old. Today's school shooting in St. Louis shaking the community to its core with families asking how and why this happened yet again in another school in America. Tara Gillespie joins us now live. Her daughters are students at that school. Tara, walk us through your day. What did you hear first? What did you do and what did your daughter see? Well, actually, today's my birthday, so I was at home kind of chilling out and my daughter texts me about some plans that she had and then right after we talked about those plans she said she was ready to go home and I'm like no you're not coming home and then she says well they're shooting at the school so I was just kind of like taken aback because I wasn't sure if she was you know being for real I guess I could say. Okay, as a mother, when, when your daughter, when you realized that this was serious, what, what did you think? I immediately uh, called my husband and asked him if he had heard anything because uh, he was at work. And I jumped up and I was talking to him and he's like, no, I haven't heard anything about it. So I'm like, well, let me get dressed because I'm going to see what's going on. So I tried to call the school and I got no answer from anyone at the school. When you finally realized that there indeed was a shooter there, what was going through your head and, and, and what, what did your children see? Uh, honestly, I don't even know what was going through my head. The only thing that I could really think of was getting there to get to them to make sure they were okay. Um, my youngest daughter, she said, Mom, they're shooting and we're, I'm hiding right now. And I hadn't heard from my other daughter, so I got kind of worried. And... I'm, I'm texting and trying to find out where everyone was and to see if everything was okay. And then I jumped in the car and like I sped down the street. Like I'm like maybe 10 or 15 minutes away from the school. And it just kind of hit me once I got five minutes away from the school and I couldn't get through because everything was blocked off. There was traffic backed up so far. And I just like, I kind of panicked. And, and then, Tara, t did, your, did your children actually see the shooter? Did they hear the shooting? So they heard the shooting, but they didn't actually see. Um, one of my daughter that was texting me first uh, while she were, and her other classmates and the teacher were hiding in the classroom, they heard the shooter outside their door. They heard the shots, and they heard him rattling the door now trying to get into the classroom but he wasn't able to get in um the teacher had moved some desk up against the door and all the kids were hiding off in a far corner of the classroom so she pretty much heard everything um the reason why she even like kind of found out what was really going on is because her friend that she was in class with her brother was one of the one of the students that did get shot and he uh, called his mom, and I, I believe the mom called uh, the sister to try to find out what was going on as well. Did, did your, any of your children know anything about this shooter? We're, we're being told he, he attended the school at one point. I think they didn't know him personally or have, like, any type of engagement with him ever. But I think they knew, you know, that, yeah, he was a senior at the school last year, and he did graduate. As, as a parent and... and Unfortunately, you know, pe people have died in this school shooting as well. Um, were you okay with the way that the city and the school responded to this? Absolutely. Um, they went in without hesitation to try to save as many children as possible. And I'm so grateful that they did act in the way that they did because you never know how many more people could have died had they not went in as they did towards the fire, towards the gunmen, instead of, you know, just trying to gauge the situation. They went in trying to make sure that as many students were safe. 
And then finally, I mean, you're going to have to at some point send your kids back to school again. Is anything going to change with that process, how you send them back to school? For me, I'm going to worry every day now. It's going to be a waiting game every day when they leave the house to when they call me and tell me they're home for the day. Because you send your kids out every morning thinking, you know, they'll be all fine. They're going to be at school. You know, they're going to be safe. Their security, the teachers are going to be safe with them and now it's just going to be like I hope I don't get another call I hope I don't get another text or another automated message from the school just for saying that the schools are on lockdown Tara Gillespie a, a parent of of students who went to that school in St. Louis where there was a school shooting today Tara thank you for your time thank you for talking to us tonight Turning to our other big headline tonight, the concerning health news about the triple threat of respiratory viruses, COVID, the flu, and RSV, which is mostly affecting children. And now more and more states are reporting a shortage of pediatric hospital beds. Gabe Gutierrez has more for us tonight. Tonight, growing concerns over a possible triple-demic this winter, the flu, RSV, and COVID converging. Cases keep rising much earlier than usual. Nearly half of a Virginia high school, about a thousand students, were out Friday with flu-like symptoms. Classes resumed today after administrators canceled some weekend activities. We've all been inside for a long time, and the germs are are what they are. A major pharmacy now says flu activity at its clinics has more than doubled over the past two weeks. Rhode Island, Delaware, Maine, and Washington D.C. now report more than 90 percent of their pediatric hospital beds are full. Several other states between 80 and 90 percent. Many patients battling RSV, a common respiratory illness that's usually like a simple cold, but can be very serious in children under two or older adults. He was having a hard time breathing. He was skipping breaths. In South Carolina, Corey Robertson's newborn son had RSV and was on a ventilator. I was very scared. Um, you know, he's seven weeks old. Um, so I definitely had fear that I haven't really felt before, just the unknown of what was going on. In Providence, Rhode Island, Hasbro Children's Hospital is now at 125% capacity. Extra patients staying in the emergency department while they wait for available beds to be admitted. The last few weeks is something that I've never seen before. This children's floor clinical manager has worked here 22 years. What are you most worried about as we head into the winter? I'm worried about the kids getting sicker and the lack of beds and just the volume of children that we have in the hospital and being able to fit them all in for the care that they need. Another problem, recently more pediatric units across the country have closed, straining the system. We're bringing patients into areas of the hospital that we never used before and we are trying to sort of relocate staff to those areas to, to best care for them. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us live tonight from Providence, Rhode Island. Gabe, you've been covering the story for the past few weeks now, this major threat of getting sick. Doctors are urging people to make sure their COVID and flu shots are up to date. Uh, yeah, that's right, Tom. Just 6% of Americans have received their Omicron booster shot. And tomorrow, President Biden is set to get his own dose in his push to get people protected, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez first. Gabe, we appreciate it. So with the threat of three major illnesses, it's so important to know the facts and how you can protect you and your family. I want to bring in chief medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, who joins us live on set tonight here on Top Story. So, Dr. John, let's start with real advice. Vaccines, boosters, flu shots, COVID boosters. People seem not to be getting them. What's going on? And I think part of it is the vaccine fatigue that people have had because over the last two and a half years, we've had to get numerous shots and boosters. But you have to remember, these are there for a specific reason. They are saving you from dying and getting seriously ill from these diseases. Not necessarily from getting the disease, but getting seriously ill. And so COVID boosters, you need to get updated on that, especially if you haven't been updated in the last few months. Flu, great time to get it. We've been talking about getting it before Halloween. You want to get it this week because the flu season came early and it's coming in hot and heavy. RSV, we don't have a vaccine for that yet, but you want to keep your immune system as strong as possible, and you do that by vaccinating against the other diseases, 
so they don't bump your immune system down and you're susceptible to it. So, Dr. John, we've been covering this story a lot, obviously in the Northeast, but it's across the country that this is happening? It is. It's across the country, and it's expanded very, very rapidly. Last week we were talking about 32 states, and it went up to 42 states. Now it's across the country. And usually we don't start seeing this until November, December time frame, maybe even January. And so the concern is, with the flu, is it going to start getting worse? RSV, we typically don't see that until December through February. Is it going to get worse as well? And you can see the pattern here that things are starting early. We want to make sure they don't get worse. You know, with the fear of these three illnesses, is there a chance you can catch them at the same time? You know, theoretically, there's a chance you can catch two, maybe even three at the same time, but it's very, very rare for somebody to have that happen. But what can happen is you can get one. Let's say you get COVID. Yeah. You recover from there, your immune system is still trying to recover. You get exposed to the flu. You get the flu. You recover from there, you get exposed to RSV. So you can see how these things can sequentially happen. So you want to be careful. And plus, we also know that we haven't had RSV in the last few years because yeah. of the lockdowns we've had and the social distancing and masking. And so there's a bigger pool of people who are susceptible to it, including adults, we can pass it on to the children, those seven-week-olds that could really be in a world of problems if they get it. Yeah, we got to be careful. Okay, Dr. John, we thank you so much, as always, for joining Top Story tonight. All right, now to the severe weather threat at this hour. Millions across the South bracing for high winds, hail, and possible tornadoes. And out west, several states already slammed with the first major snowstorm of the season. Parts of Utah and Colorado buried under nearly two feet of snow. For more on that threat in the South, let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, walk us through the next 24 hours. Yeah, Tom, this is the time of year we do get severe weather outbreaks. You think of this kind of weird. You think of it over the summer and the spring. But as we get those rushes of cold air coming in, we still have enough humidity, we can get some severe weather outbreaks, usually two or three of them each October or November. So here's the map. 22 million people are at risk from the rest of this evening and this afternoon in areas of the west heading towards the areas around Louisiana overnight. So that's 22 million people in total. The strongest storms so far have been concentrated in the line from Abilene and now heading towards the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Right now you see Abilene is in the clear. That line of storms just to the areas to the east of them. Severe thunderstorm watch goes up until 9 o'clock. So far, we've had reports of like garage doors blown in. We've had a trampoline that blew across the street. A lot of wind damage reports. But now we're starting to see some reports of large hail, too. There's one storm that's located right here. Severe thunderstorm warning with it. Going to try to head towards Stephenville. They're saying about half dollar size hail as possible with that storm. So that's the kind of weather we're going to be dealing with through the rest of this evening. And then tomorrow, we continue our severe weather threat right through the heart of Mississippi. Mississippi and then eventually through areas of Alabama. And if that's not enough to worry about, well, a lot of heavy rain tonight, especially our friends from Fort Smith to Springfield, all the way up Interstate 44 heading towards St. Louis. We are under a risk of some flash flooding, especially early tomorrow morning. If you're heading out the door, we could see one to two inches per hour with some of these thunderstorms. And that's that flash flood risk area. And in case you're wondering where all of this mess is going as we head towards the rest of the week, by Wednesday, it begins to head through the Great Lakes and exit. This is not heading for the East coast and then by the time we get to the thursday friday period more rain returns to the south but the east remains pretty dry so the worst of it again heading towards dallas fort worth in the next couple hours huh all right bill karen's for us tonight bill thank you for that okay we want to turn to politics now and the midterms just about over two weeks away you can see 14 days and 23 hours away to be exact a new nbc news poll showing just how deeply polarized the country has become take a look at this about 80 percent of registered voters both republicans and democrats saying that the opposing party poses a political threat that could destroy america as we know it the poll revealing deep anger this election cycle and sky high stakes for both parties with 70 percent of voters saying they're very interested in the midterms. Let's break this down now and see how it breaks down per party. So Republicans have a slight edge here. You can see 78% of Republicans highly interested in this election versus 69% of Democrats. And as we keep going, we also asked another really interesting question here. If your party's candidate has a moral failure, who would you vote for? Well, most party people voting for the people from their respective party. 63% of Democrats sticking with their candidates, 67% of Republicans. But you have to remember, in a tight race, this could matter. So 4% of Democrats said they would switch to the Republican, whereas 6% of Republicans said they would do the same. And finally, interest in this election. So if you watch these numbers here, 61% of interest in the election in 2010, they had 87 million votes cast. That number dropped in 2014 to 55%. Then you have a lower number of voters, of people voting. Finally, in 2018, you had 65%. 2022, we're even higher than that. We're going to have to wait and see. We know that in 2018, 50% of registered voters actually turned out to vote. 
We'll have to see what the number is in 2022. With that, I want to bring in NBC News senior political reporter Mark Caputo. He is our man in Florida. Mark, are you feeling these numbers there in the Sunshine State? Are people uh, excited about this election? Is there a lot of ad spending? Are, are you hearing this from voters? There's a lot of ad spending on the Republican side, especially because they just have more money and they also have more enthusiasm. I think one of the big problems that Democrats have is they've been flat on their backs in the state for a few years, and it's really manifesting itself in the polling. If you look at the polling averages, Ron DeSantis is well ahead of Charlie Crist. And that's in a state that used to be a battle, or better said, used to be a swing state. Now we're a battleground, but boy, if, if the polls are right or some of the recent ones are right, I really wonder if we could even call ourselves a battleground state. Uh, let alone just a red state. Yeah, when you uh, talk to Dem race between yeah, when you talk to Democratic ahead. strategists, they they like to call Florida now a red state. I do want to talk about the Florida governor's race and, and tonight a very big debate. Ron DeSantis facing off against Democratic challenger Charlie Crist. Uh, the real clear politics average has DeSantis up by about ten points right now, a pretty comfortable lead right there. How does DeSantis usually do in debates, Mark? He did relatively well against Andrew Gillum, and ultimately he won that race, and that was a bad year for Republicans. Uh, that was before a live audience, though. This debate that you're going to see tonight is before a studio audience. No one's allowed in there, so it's going to be a little more staid. I imagine that DeSantis is going to go on offense. That's his style. Uh, and I, I, I just don't know if the polling is right. I don't know what Charlie Chris can do to turn it around. So you, you do have these incredible images coming out of places like Sanibel, the hurricane recovery, where the bridge is being rebuilt in record time. But you also have controversial decisions like flying those Venezuelan refugee families up to Martha's Vineyard. Is this debate going to be entirely about DeSantis's record? Well, I mean, midterm elections or re-election races are referendums on the incumbent. So, yes, it usually is the case. But if you look at our news partner, Telemundo, they did a poll of Florida Hispanics. Uh, Florida Hispanic voters tend to be uh, Democratic voters on the whole, uh, a little bit of a swing vote. Uh, DeSantis is winning that demographic. And not only that, when you look at the internals of the polling, he's winning on Hurricane Ian response by something like 40 points. That is, people favored his response. When you get over to the Venezuelan migrants, that poll question was actually asked and DeSantis had the approval of Florida Hispanics with 50%, with 43% opposing. So even that controversial act, uh, something that people thought would cost him Hispanic voters, hasn't, at least not in the majority. So right now, DeSantis is in a very enviable position for a Republican. He's ahead in the polls. He's ahead in fundraising. He's ahead in the Latino vote, which Democrats need and rely on to win the state. And he's ahead in ad spending. You add all those things up, and it's just a really, really tough time for Charlie. And Charlie Chris has the name recognition, but he also has the name recognition of when he was Republican. He's now a Democrat. Of course, voters aren't going to love that. Um, I do have to ask you, though, a lot of people are talking about Ron DeSantis obviously being a, a candidate for president. Would that hurt him at all? He wouldn't be the first Florida politician to, to, to run for higher office while campaigning for another. So do you think that plays into people's calculations at all? I'm not sure, but what I can say is that if he decides to run, by then more than likely Donald Trump will already be an announced candidate. And what would hurt him is Donald Trump, because despite seeing some of the attrition in the polling, the fact is, is at least as of now, the Republican Party remains the party of Trump. And if there's one thing that Donald Trump has taught us is that anyone he runs against, he will throw the kitchen sink, the plumbing, the wiring, all of the appliances at. And I'm not sure DeSantis wants to deal with that. All right, Mark Caputo, who will be following that debate for the Florida governor tonight. Mark, thank you. Overseas now in the latest in the war in Ukraine, Russia today alleging to the U.N. that Ukraine plans to detonate a so-called dirty bomb in its own territory. But Kiev and the U.S. are denouncing those claims as a lie. This all comes as Russian attacks continue to hammer Ukraine's infrastructure. Cal Perry has the latest. Eight months into this war and Ukraine continues to make gains on the battlefield while Putin exacts a heavy price on the home front. A wave of strikes across Ukrainian cities has put both electricity and water grids on the brink of collapse. The power went out for more than a million people all at once and for many it remains off. While in the southern city of Mykolaiv, people queue for water and in the east a hospital works in darkness. Meanwhile, Russia continues to hold major infrastructure points hostage. 
and more threats of a dirty bomb. This time, Russia saying Ukraine will do the unthinkable. These so-called dirty bombs are easier to deploy. The delivery system could be in the form of a backpack, not a rocket. The United States, for years, feared terror groups like ISIS would use these crude devices. The Ukrainian foreign minister calling the claims, quote, absurd and dangerous, saying, quote, Russians often accuse others of what they plan themselves. U.S. officials have said they're watching closely, but have no indication either country is preparing a dirty bomb. There is growing concern here about Europe's largest nuclear power plant found in Ukraine, but under Russian occupation. Officials telling us the staff inside is being tortured, working under impossible conditions. The concern is not just that there could be a disaster, but that Russia could divert power away from Ukraine into Russia, that the lights could go off here and just not come back on. Tom? Cal Perry for us. Cal, thank you. Still ahead tonight, sparking hate. The shocking anti-Semitic demonstrations in Los Angeles referencing hateful comments made by Kanye West. How the rapper's ex-wife, Kim Kardashian, is responding tonight. Plus violence on the subways, the chilling video of a man you saw it right there, pushed onto the tracks, with the mayor is now doing to fight surging crime, and what he's telling strap hangers to do. And the incredible rescue in Florida, the effort to save three people trapped after they crashed into a canal. Top story, just getting started on this Monday night. We're back with new video showing a vicious attack on a New York City subway platform. The city's mayor and state's governor announcing new measures to fight the violence. Crime on the transit system spiking 40% since last year. Stephen Romo has more. Horrifying video shows the moment a 32-year-old man was knocked onto the train tracks in New York. The victim, incredibly, was not physically injured, according to police, but the disturbing violence is just one of the latest examples of rising crime on New York City transit. Another example, a 14-year-old girl stabbed in the subway this weekend after an altercation with two other teen girls. But if New Yorkers don't feel safe, we are failing. Mayor Eric Adams now teaming up with New York Governor Kathy Hochul over the weekend. The pair announcing that the state would help pay for an additional 1,200 overtime shifts per day for police officers to patrol the subway. I say do whatever it takes. The plan also includes installing more cameras in each subway car and two new psychiatric centers to help people with mental illness. Adding more cops, installing more cameras and providing more care. On Friday, Mayor Adams even suggesting in a Fox 5 interview that strap hangers look up from their phones and lose the headphones. Not having your iPods in, not focusing on phone, and I say yes to that. I do the same. Did you guys see uh, officers down there? Did you see uh, security, that type of thing? Hey, now that you say that, I don't think I did. No. It can't just be for the police, can't just be the city government. You know, the, the responsibility's also got to be on us. But former NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly says there is more the city can be doing, like reevaluating the Transit Police Bureau. This is not brain surgery. You go back and look at the things we were doing then, and you re-implement them. But uh, apparently the mayor doesn't want to doesn't want to do this. Patrick J. Lynch, the head of the city's major police union, has also publicly criticized the plan, saying the increased workload for cops is unsustainable. To date, there's been a 41% spike in transit crime overall compared to last year, with countless frightening examples caught on camera. And there have already been 18 shooting victims this year on mass transit. Last year, three, significantly up even after the 10 people that were shot on that one April morning in Sunset Park. And all this while subway ridership has remained suppressed since the pandemic. Over the weekend, Adams hitting the subway, listening to New Yorkers as the city strives for a safer commute. I've lived in the city 20 years. I don't feel as safe. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now live from outside a subway stop here in Midtown Manhattan. So, Stephen, what happened to that suspect who pushed the man into the tracks? Yeah, Tom, there's actually a big update on that today. Police announcing the arrest of 41-year-old LaMail Lecrae in Brooklyn, and he is charged with a slew of things, including attempted murder, harassment, and more. So, Stephen, you know, the NYPD continues to point out that the total crime on the subway is still below pre-pandemic levels, but you were pointing out that's not exactly a fair comparison, right? 
Yeah, context really is key when talking about these numbers because ridership for the subway system for mass transit has not returned to those 2019 levels. It's still only about 60 to 65 percent of those levels. So when you see crime approaching that number when ridership has not, you see the discrepancy and why that context is so important, Tom. All right, Stephen Romo for us tonight. Stephen, we appreciate it. Next tonight to those anti-Semitic comments from Kanye West. It's a story we've been covering for weeks, but this weekend, the dangerous impact of his words on full display in California. This frightening scene in Los Angeles, an anti-Semitic hate group hanging a banner, look at that, over Interstate 405 that read, quote, Kanye is right about the Jews. And that's not all. These anti-Semitic flyers found in mailboxes in several California cities just days after Kanye claimed that in an interview he could continue using hateful language. But his comments come amid a surge of anti-Semitic incidents. Take a look at this. In California alone, just California, the number of hate crimes against the Jewish community jumped more than 32 percent from 2020 to 2021. And advocates fear Kanye's rhetoric will encourage even more. Kanye West has given license to extremists across the board to evangelize their anti-Semitism. He's created a kind of window of opportunity and they're flooding in. Today, Kanye's talent agency, CAA, one of the biggest in this country, confirmed that it is no longer representing West and his ex-wife, Kim Kardashian, breaking her silence, tweeting, hate speech is never okay or excusable. I stand together with the Jewish community and call on the terrible violence and hateful rhetoric towards them to come to an immediate end. As for Adidas, the company says their partnership with Kanye is, quote, under review, but has not responded to requests for further comments. When we come back, more news from Los Angeles, the shocking death of beloved comedian Leslie Jordan, what we're learning about his tragic passing next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with an update of the disappearance of Harmony Montgomery in New Hampshire. Police charging Harmony's father, Adam Montgomery, with her murder. Harmony went missing back in 2019 when she was five years old, but her disappearance was not reported until last year. Authorities did not say whether her body had been found. Montgomery is scheduled to be arraigned tomorrow. The Michigan teenager who killed four students at Oxford High School in 2021 pleading guilty to murder. The 16-year-old appearing in court pleading guilty to all 24 charges against him, including first-degree murder and terrorism. The teen faces up to life in prison without parole. His parents, who have pled not guilty to involuntary manslaughter, will be tried in January. Next to a dramatic rescue in Florida after a car crashed into a canal. Take a look at this video. A deputy from the Indian River County Sheriff's Office spotting the vehicle, which was upside down and sinking fast. An Amazon driver also racing into the water to help. All three people trapped inside eventually pulled out. Two women were treated for minor injuries but are expected to be okay. And comedian Leslie Jordan has tragically died in a single car crash. Reps for Jordan confirming the Tennessee native crashed after suffering an apparent medical episode in Hollywood. The actor best known for his scene-stealing roles on Will and Grace and American Horror Story, later catapulting into Hearts Nationwide with his posts on social media during the pandemic. Jordan was 67 years old. Okay, we turn to education now and new test scores revealing just how much the pandemic impacted students here in the U.S., with many now falling behind in subjects like math and reading. Rahema Ellis has the details. More evidence tonight that nearly three years of pandemic disruptions had a devastating effect on students. The National Assessment of Educational Progress tested nearly 450,000 fourth and eighth graders across the country. The math results were especially alarming. Only 26% of eighth graders were proficient or above in math, down from 34% in 2019. The average eighth grade math score fell in every state except Utah. The literature has shown us that math was very sensitive to uh, instruction. In reading, just 33% of fourth graders were proficient or above, down from 35%. In Union, New Jersey, one superintendent is keenly aware of the problem. Challenges are greater than uh, I've experienced in any year of my 30-year career. What are they doing about it? In the classroom, teachers focus on small group instruction, closely track individual progress throughout the year, and students spend time relearning social skills that experts say are necessary to improve their academics. In terms of saying just how effective it is, would you say you know already? It's not too soon to tell that we're making progress. 
we are seeing some uptick in academic performance, albeit very incremental. But it's also very important to apply it. In rebuilding those social skills, fourth grade teacher Cynthia Carhart sees improvement. You can't expect a child to grow three grade levels in one year, but as long as they're making growth and they're showing you that they're trying, that's really important. Rahema Ellis, NBC News, Union, New Jersey. All right, we thank Rahema for all this. For a closer look at what this means for children's future and the country's education system, I want to bring in senior fellow at the American Federation for Children, Corey DeAngelis. Corey, put this into perspective. How monumental of a problem is this? I mean, these are drastic drops. These are the biggest declines that we've seen in mathematics in about three decades since they first started the assessment back in 1990. And we also found that states that had schools closed longer had bigger uh, drops in mathematics scores. We've seen three different independent evaluations finding the same relationship. More school closures, uh, let more learning loss at the same time. And Catholic schools, which were open uh, much more than the public schools, they saw smaller academic losses than the traditional public schools. I, I want to get to that in a second. I want to pull up this, this quote from the Associated Press and read it to our viewers here. Um, this is from a, a teacher. When we experience a one or two point decline, we're talking about it as a significant impact on a student's achievement. In math, we experienced an eight point decline, historic for this assessment. My question to you is, is there time to catch up for these students that are so far behind now in the public school system? Will they be given the time and, and can they catch up? I mean, it's really hard to tell what it's going to look like going forward. It depends on how the system responds to the needs of individual families. And right now, the districts are sitting on about 93% of the American Rescue Plan funding, over $100 billion that was allocated to K-12 education. It hasn't even been spent yet, according to the Wall Street Journal's uh, latest reporting on this in earlier this summer. Uh, I think a way to improve the incentives is to have more competition in the school system, allow the families to choose the schools that work best for their kids, and then the public schools have an incentive incentive to spend the money wisely, put it towards uh, uh, alleviating these learning losses, maybe allocating some of the funding towards private tutoring uh, and, and other. Uh, so so let me, is the problem here, do people think, do the experts think the problem here was everyone had to do remote learning, private and public all did remote learning. Was it excessive remote learning or was it inefficient remote learning? Yeah, well, remote learning isn't the same thing as uh, a, a proper virtual education. There are a lot of virtual providers of education that do a really good job. But when the school closures happened, which were influenced by the teachers unions all across the country, they pushed for this to get more taxpayer uh, bailouts from the government. The, uh, the You're saying the ex public. extending the calendar and, and, and keeping remote learning as opposed to bringing students back into the classroom. Yeah, it extended for a very long time. I mean, in some places, we talked about uh, Los Angeles a little earlier on the, on the show. They were pushing for Medicare for all, a wealth tax, and police-free schools in order to reopen the schools for in-person learning. That didn't make any sense. It had nothing to do with the students. It had, nothing, it had more to do with politics and power than safety and the needs of kids. And look, remote learning can be done in the right way, but it was really, it was a last minute thing. It was not responsive to the needs of families and it was involuntary. Families might have preferred in-person instruction for a long time and they weren't getting that. So I think going forward, if the money is spent more wisely, if it's going towards children's academic needs, uh, there could be recovery. And to be clear, you're saying the Biden administration gave these school districts the money. The money was there and then the school districts just did not allocate the funds properly? That's right. There's a, a ton of funding. It's over 190, about $190 billion was allocated to K-12 education since March of 2020. And the Wall Street Journal uh, suggests that 93% of the American Rescue Plan, Plan funding has not been spent yet. And well, in, why are they holding on to it? I think they're, one, one uh, theory is that they're hiring more staff and they're saving the funding to pay for the staff in the future. That's beneficial for teachers union bosses like Randy Weingarten, who make over $500,000 a year, because that means more dues paying members, if you put members in the system, if you want people into the buildings, you have more people paying union dues that they can uh, put towards their co political contributions. In Los Angeles, for example, the latest data that I've seen, they suggested that they were going to increase the amount of funding overall by about 69% relative to, to 2019. They were planning on putting 8% more teachers in the buildings, 25% more custodial workers in the buildings, and about 80% more so social workers in the buildings, all while they were losing about 6% of their 
their student body. And look, we can make arguments about whether that was a wise investment or not, but where else do you see that you're losing your customers and then you start pour, pouring more and more people and hiring more staff? And that means less money for things like teacher salaries. I mean, there's trade-offs right. with all this funding too. Corey DeAngelis, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. Coming up next, the deadly plane crash in the waters off Costa Rica. The owner of a popular gym chain reportedly on board will have an update on these recovery efforts. Stay with us. Back down with Top Stories Global Watch and the new Prime Minister of the UK, former Finance Minister, Rushuhi Sunak will be the first person of color to lead the UK and the youngest to do so in more than 200 years. He will be the country's third prime minister in three months following the short-lived leadership of Liz Truss and the resignation of Boris Johnson after multiple scandals. A recovery mission underway off the coast of Costa Rica after an apparent plane crash. The small plane was traveling from Mexico to Costa Rica when it went off the radar with six people on board. One of the passengers is the owners of Gold's Gym. So far, at least two bodies have been recovered. Backpacks and other pieces of debris were also found. And the Biden administration taking its most aggressive action yet to target President Daniel, Daniel Ortega's regime in Nicaragua. The State Department announcing new visa restrictions on 500 Nicaraguans and their families, including top government officials. President Biden also threatening to ban Americans from doing business with the country's gold industry. Okay, when we come back, fighting for Thai, we'll introduce you to an incredible family we've been following for more than 10 years, how they're honoring their beloved son and helping so many. Stay with us. Finally tonight, honoring one super little boy and his incredible legacy. It's a story and journey I've been following for more than 10 years through countless rounds of surgeries and cancer treatments even after his passing, Ty Campbell's bright spirit continues to shine and change lives. Ty, that's great. When I first met the Campbell family more than a decade ago, they knew the road for their son Ty would be hard. Imagining that, that he wouldn't be there someday, you just don't know how you're gonna go on. How are you gonna live for your other child? In 2010, when Ty was just two years old, doctors discovered a tumor on his brain stem. I've been crying for what feels like an eternity. But in between my tears, I have an overwhelming sense of freedom. Ty's mom, Cindy, starting a blog, sharing the family's roller coaster ride of treatments and therapies. What kept the family going? Ty's smile and words of support from families all over the world. We read the comments to Ty because it makes him happy. But after 20 surgeries and more than 200 nights in the hospital. Today we were told that there are no more treatment options for Ty, that his MRI Saturday night shows progressive leptomeningeal disease in three different areas. The family celebrating Ty Lewis Campbell's life through a foundation in his name. It was just a simple question. One day that I asked him when he was really not doing well, I asked him, what do you want to do when you get all better? And he just said, I'm going to jump in a muddy puddle. And it was just the simplest thing. And it stuck with me forever because I thought as a grown up, that'd be the last thing on our minds. The result of that question, the Muddy Puddles Project, one of several ways the Campbells have raised money for pediatric cancer research, along with celebrating Ty's legacy. Let's celebrate the idea that these kids can have fun and do these great activities in honor of those that can't. Over the last 10 years, the Ty Lewis Campbell Foundation has raised more than $2 million for cancer research projects. The Campbell family working to help fill a critical funding gap for childhood cancer. Even though he's not here to witness it, I feel that he is watching and loving this a year after year, every moment of it. And with that, Cindy and Lewis Campbell join us now. Guys, thank you so much. What a journey over those 10 years. Um, I know you guys marked his passing uh, this week. What, what was that like? Uh, the 10 year, it's, it's deep, but 10 years is a long time. I, you know, I think um, reflecting back a little bit, the hardest, the hardest time in terms of, his lo of, of the loss was uh, I call it 1842. He had lived 18, 1841 days. And, um, you know, when we passed that mark, he was gone longer than he was with us. Um, the 10 year mark, I'm finding more of a, uh, I find it to be more of a um, accomplishment year. Um, it's been a decade that we've been doing this and, and funding research. And, uh, and I think we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished for him and, and have definitely honored him. Cindy, it's 
been incredible what you have done, and you, you guys have shown so much strength to this day. You've raised more than $2 million, and it's really changed the course of your lives. Mm -hmm. what, what has that been like? I, um, I tried to go back to work and in my career uh, after losing Ty, and I realized I was a completely different person. So it has been a journey in every way of just trying to figure out how can we take this experience and use it and leverage the community we have and continue this nonprofit. And so um, I've put all of our, we put all of our attention, all of our resources into that. I changed, you know, did not go back to my career and started working um, actually most recently to support some of the best principal investigators in New York City uh, who focus on rare pediatric brain tumors at Weill Cornell Medicine. And you guys learned something, and, and, and you've explained this to me, and we should explain it to our viewers. It's very hard to raise money. It's very hard for funds to go to pediatric cancer research. Explain. I mean, I think people get fatigued. We had a community of support that just loved Ty, and they still do, but after 10 years, there's other causes. There's a lot of, you know, we're constantly asking, you know, support us, support us year over year, and it can become exhausting. So um, that's the challenge in fundraising, but we're lucky enough that we have a really supportive community. And I think um, once you raise those funds, how are you going to donate it and make a change? And uh, we learned very early on that you can't just take the money and put it towards an institution and, and hope that they do the right thing. You have to you have to build relationships and over the years through conferences, through you know collaborating with other foundations, we've learned how to meet with uh, principal investigators directly and um, and get their proposals, bring them to our advisory board, and and fund exactly what we want with the least amount of fees involved. Something you you guys always remind uh, anybody that goes to your events of is only 4% of the national research budget is directed towards childhood cancer, which includes 12 cancer types and hundreds of subtypes unique to children. And that's why it makes it so hard to raise money and for those funds to go to the right places, right? Absolutely. There's so many tumor types within childhood cancer. So you're, you're kind of putting it all in one category. And if you think about just the world of research around cancer, it's huge. But when you drill down to all these different types of cancers that children are affected with, it's completely different than what adults are affected with. There's so far fewer researchers focused on it, far fewer um, examples to learn from, tumor tissue to study, um, labs focused on it, data on what's working, what's not working, and all of that requires funding and all requires family foundations like ours because um, they, uh, 80% or more has to be funded by these community efforts, these families that have been impacted. And it's a sad reality that, you know, dads are running marathons to raise money for <coughs> research when they should be focused on their kids, but it's yeah. just the way it is. If people want to help, they're watching tonight, what, what, what can they do? Where can they donate? Um, the Ty Lewis Campbell Foundation, the TLCfoundation.org. Um, first and foremost, you know, we are very active on our website. We keep it updated if you want to learn more. Um, we'd love to get kids involved. Everything from penny fundraisers to soccer games, we're there. You know, we support it at a community level and we think that they're, you know, the ones that are going to make keep this going. So we're very big on getting the kids involved and um, just bringing more people from the community that can give and that can support and that can um, advocate for this cause is so important. Cindy and Lou Campbell, guys, thank you so much. I, I met you guys through a story. You've become friends, and as I've said before, you guys are my heroes, and you have done so much to honor your son's legacy. You should be very proud, and I know you guys fight every day. Thank you for coming on Top thank Story you. tonight. Thanks, yeah. Tom. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.